Thank you very much, and thank you for still being here um, before lunch. My name is Sebastian Copeland. I'm a, I'm a polar explorer. Um, I've got actually a background in environmental science, um, and I'm mostly a climate researcher, um, I specialize in glaciology. So I've reached both the, uh, the North and the South Pole on foot. I've put over 8,000 kilometers um, on foot in the polar regions. In uh, Antarctica alone, I did a 4,000 kilometer crossing uh, from east to west, the first transcontinental crossing of Antarctica. If right now you're thinking, wow, that sounds incredibly like a job for a donkey, I would say that it's not at all, because even a donkey would refuse to do this job. It's, uh, it, it's hard. It's, uh, every day is, uh, is a brutal experience. Um, the North Pole in particular, which I crossed in 2009, attempted it again in 2017. It was a 700 kilometer journey, which by far was the most difficult experience uh, for me and considered the hardest expedition in the world. Um, by measure of comparison, there have been 42 people who've walked unassisted on the Arctic Sea to reach the North Pole. Uh, and with Everest, there have been 8,306 summits, just to give you a measure of comparison. This is the hardest expedition in the world that nobody has really heard much about. And it's too bad because Polar expeditions I found to be an incredible microcosm for, uh, for life. They teach you a lot about you, and they teach you a lot about the world that we live in. On a personal note, um, have you heard of tunnel vision? It's a terminology that's used in sports a lot. Um, it refers to um, this heightened state of performance. The great basketball player, Michael Jordan, uh, coined the term being in the zone, you know, where you you sort of have this heightened, razor-sharp focus, and it feels like you're just floating towards your goal, and you, you're not really realizing what happens until it's over and you've succeeded. Well, the North Pole is not like that. It's, it's literally the hardest thing that, um, that I've ever done. It is all pain. There is nothing here that says that I'm in the zone, uh, except maybe the war zone. Um, it was... Nonetheless, one of the more extraordinary experience, and it's also a great way to make you look like your grandfather in a very short amount of time. Uh, you can also lose years of incredible hard work every day at the gym in three months, uh, lose 15 kilos of, of good weight, all the while growing a lot of facial hair. It's great. They really should, they should put that in the brochure. Pull missions are about exceeding your best. It's about finding a purpose in putting a f one foot in front of the other. And just like Sisyphus, uh, finding purpose in moving forward. And in recent years, however, that purpose has shifted. It's no longer really about expeditions. It's no longer about personal best. They have become existential. On my way to the North Pole, I was vividly aware that the steps that I took would no longer be possible for this coming generation because the ice is thinning there so rapidly. And I returned there in 2017, failed. I'm actually planning to go there again in 2021. And I fundamentally believe that I will be the last person going to the North Pole unassisted in history. There hasn't been a mission succeeding there since 2014. And I'm planning to go there in 2021. Incidentally, I am looking for sponsorship. So if any of you are interested, come see me. When Mallory was told, why Everest? He famously said, because it's there. And for me, going to the North Pole now is because it's not going to be there anymore. There's a saying in my field that if you want to know where the world is headed, within the next number of years. You need to look no further than the polar regions because the ice tells a story. It's obviously responding to climate conditions, um, understanding that the way the ice behaves is like looking into a crystal ball. And of course, these days, you cannot disassociate the ice without mentioning climate change and as a result, the nature of human development. More than ever, humans have been on a collision course with nature. 
And nowhere is it more evident in terms of its impact than in the polar regions. I crossed Greenland from south to north, did 2,300 kilometers um, on uh, skis and kites, and got to see really what the best the planet has to offer, and also gave me an insight into what it might be like to be the last human on Earth. Literally, this is how it feels like. But I was also confronted firsthand with the nature of climate change and ocean rise, because there were huge melt ponds on Greenland where masses of areas were melting, and all of this water was being funneled down two kilometers down to the bedrock and finally exiting to the sea. In 2012, luckily I was not on Greenland then, but in the same period that I was a couple of years prior, 97% of the surface of Greenland was completely wet. Ponds like this. Mm. This had never happened in recorded history. In fact, since 2003, um, Greenland has lost four times more ice. It's a 4x factor in the last 15 years. It's losing 250 gigatons of ice per year, which sounds like an abstract figure, and of course it is. 250 gigatons represents 100 million Olympic-sized swimming pools. And that affects about one centimeter per year in ocean rise. It's considerable. I spent two seasons on a scientific research icebreaker in the Antarctica Peninsula. And while I got to uh, deepen my understanding of the ice, the experiences that I brought back reminded me of an environment that the more I got to look at it felt a lot like us. Defiant, fierce, but fragile and fleeting. In fact, it doesn't take long to understand that the relationship between ice and our relationship to, us, to, 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 to it and systemic ch changes taking place in the polar regions has, in fact, a lot to do with geop geopolitics. So while my work is about climate research, and a lot of it is about philosophical consideration, I won't lie to you. A lot of the questions I get are, how did you get into this, and of course, where do you go to the bathroom? Now, the second question is a trade secret. Um, I'll just say that you get some of the best panoramic views anywhere. Um, and for the downside, well, I mean, you're looking at it. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's cold out there. Um, but seriously, I, I realized that my passion for extreme conditions um, would be servicing my growing interest in at-risk environments. And I also quickly realized that our relationship to the ice could not be disassociated with where we're headed as a people. Now, we can all agree that we stand at a very transformative period in the history of our development. There is a paradigm shift taking place. It's socioeconomic, it's political, it's geopolitical, it's obviously environmental, and it's technological. And we're not entirely sure where it's going to end, but we know that it's coming, and it feels like it's going to be a rodeo. So I feel that central to it is humanity's relationship to nature. And in order to understand where we're going, I think it's very important to understand where we've come from. And so for that, I like to keep it small and simple and start with the universe. Small and simple, right? The universe was formed 13.8 billion years ago. It took another um, 9 billion years for our solar system to form and our planet along with it. At first, it was just gas and matter. And for the next 2 billion years, Nothing much happened except for photosynthetic life, which created life in only microscopic organisms. And that went on for another two billion years. 650 million years, the planet was entirely covered in a crust of ice. We call it the snowball Earth. That ice all melted from tectonic activities and volcanic activities below the ice and melted this entire structure within about a 1,000 years. It was effectively the first global warming period. The balance of nitrogen, oxygen, um, CO2, water vapors, and argon constitutes the thin layer of atmosphere which 580 million years ago 
led to the first complex multicellular life form. The period between 541 and 65 million years ago saw the most dramatic transformation in evolutionary, climatic, and um, geological terms. Fish, amphibian, reptiles, birds, and then mammal all developed during that period. 200 million years ago, the mass of land called Pangaea started to break up into continents and uh, developing into the five continents we have today. During that time period, there have been five mass extinction events. Every single one of us, all 30 million species existing today on this planet, are the descendants of the survivors of 4% survivors of the great Permian extinction event 251 million years ago. 65 million years ago, an asteroid allegedly hit the planet and destroyed 76% of all living creatures. Mm. Meanwhile, six million years ago, we split from an ape and developed into anatomically modern humans 175,000 years ago. Why do I go into this big paleontological analysis? Well, because in paleontological timescales, we have barely existed. In fact, it's remarkable. If you think of the start of the solar system 4.5 billion years ago as one big calendar year, 4.5 billion years ago being January 1st, today being December 31st. Humans have not appeared on the planet until 30 seconds before midnight on December 31st of that calendar year. Civilization, one-tenth of a second. So to think that we would actually be there forever is not just absurd on a planetary time scale, it's it's actually dangerous thinking. And in fact, to speed up the process is suicidal. In the time that we've been there, and particularly in the last 200 years, we've managed to destroy half of all the trees that are on the planet. We pour so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that we have fundamentally changed the chemistry of the oceans and the chemistry of the air that we breathe, choking up a quarter of all marine life form in the oceans by increasing the acidity of the oceans. In fact, we fish so many fish out of the ocean and pour so much plastic into it that by 2050 there will be more plastic in the oceans than fish. Scientists tell us that we're presently in the midst of the sixth mass extinction event. Do you know that since 1970, 60% of planets, of, of species on this planet, have disappeared since 1970. And they tell us that by the end of the century, 75% of species will have gone, which is essentially the equivalent of that asteroid that hit the planet 65 million years ago. Now, there's a very simple question. It doesn't take a genius to start to think, if 75% of species are going to be extinct by the end of the century, how do we fit within that statistic? What makes us think that somehow we will evade those numbers. That, again, is not just irresponsible. It's a very, very dangerous way of looking at it, something that we've inherited from our Judeo-Christian thinking, you know, placing us at the center of the universe. The statistics on climate are fairly straightforward. We all understand them by now. The last five years have been the warmest years in history. Um, I mean, since uh, the start of, of measurements in 1880, the last decade has been the warmest. And if you're 34 years old in the room today, you have never known a planet that has not been warmer than 20th century average. Not surprisingly, ice is the first line of defense. Nothing reacts to a warming climate more obviously than melting ice. The Arctic region, an area that I know quite well, has lost 47% of its ice cover since 1980. Uh, basically, in the last 30 years, 47% of the ice there has gone. This is what the transformation from 2014 to 2018 means. Most of all of that transformation in, t term in heat distribution is, um, is developed in the northern area. It's not surprising under those 
uh, this scenario that the uh, Arctic sea cap will be gone uh, within the next 20 to 30 years. This would be a first in about 2.6 million years, so long predating the existence of humans at the beginning of the Pleistocene period. And the conditions, of course, are all about actions generating a reaction and that reaction being a consequence. We call that a feedback effect. The feedback, as many of you understand about the reflectivity of infrared um, radiated energy from the sun, um, reflects well in a white surface. Of course, when that white surface disappears, it absorbs that energy and distributes it either on land and in the oceans. When it comes to warming world and a warming temperature, one degree of change in temperature on the planet equates to about one meter of global ocean rise. So while the sea ice on the Arctic Sea will not contribute a net-net um, growth in ocean levels from melting ice, the feedback effect of thermal expansion, which is the warming of the ocean around it, certainly will. Antarctica for a long time was considered a sleeping giant. It's such a huge mass of ice. It comprises about 95% of all fresh water on the planet. And for the longest time, it seemed like it was actually quite stable. And what happened is 10 years ago, NASA discovered that the melting on Antarctica was not just happening, but it was accelerating. In fact, in the last five years, ice melt in Antarctica has doubled. This is a big deal because it hasn't happened openly. We've seen Larsen A's and B ice shelves breaking up, and we thought, okay, this is sort of part and parcel of climate change. But generally speaking, we were not really well aware of what the implication of East and West Antarctica was until about 10 years ago. And that focus primarily looked at the Pines and Thwaites glaciers, massive glaciers, about 250 kilometers in width, very, very, very deep into the territory. And all of this was happening below the surface. In other words, cold water from the melting of the ice on top was driving warm currents below the surface of the ocean and melting it in a downward slope that scientists have called unstoppable. Now, I work in science, and I will tell you one thing is that scientists do not like to, word, to use words like unstoppable for a simple fact that, that if it stops, eventually you look like an idiot because you made a statement that was disproven by a uh, natural phenomenon. So when scientists go and say this is unstoppable, it means that the process of melting that is happening below the surface of Antarctica is not something that will be over within the next few lifetimes. It is going to continue until the terrain of Antarctica slopes back up, and this is going to be a few hundred kilometers in, and by then, just the Pines and Thwaites Glacier will have melted 1.2 meters of global ocean rise, just these two glaciers alone. Mm. If you think that's bad, the Toten Glacier, which is the size of California, is now has been discovered since last year in the process of its own melting. There is a vast network of rivers and lakes below the Toten Glacier. Once again, the size of California. Enough ice here to raise ocean levels by over three meters within the next 100 to 200 years. What's relevant about this is that the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN-designated body that, anal uh, that analyzes climate conditions, has not factored neither the Pines, the Thwaites, or the Totten Glacier in its calculations. So the last assessment of the IPCC has factored for 1.5 meters at maximum by the end of the century. But we know now that the Pines and Thwaites alone have four feet or 1.2 meters, and that the Totten Glacier within the next 100 to 200 years will be three meters, a total of 4.2 meters just for those three glaciers alone. The story of melting ice is the story of the breakdown of socioeconomic systems around the world. We lose 30 meters of coastal region for every 30 centimeters of ice loss. 61% of global GNP is generated within 100 kilometers of the coast. 80% of the population lives within coastal regions. 
So you can understand that when regions like Bangladesh and Indonesia and Southeast Asia, but also, of course, Florida and, and New York and the Netherlands and Italy, and all of those regions represent unimaginable trillions of GNP value that is at risk for motion rise. But it's not it. Climate change and ice melt has everything to do with food commodities and food scarcity as well. Take the Mekong Delta, the region in Southeast Asia, which is considered the bread basket of Southeast Asia. It produces it's the second largest rice producer in the world. That rice grows just a few centimeters from ocean level. And there is no question that within this century, this enormous area that provides 50% of food resources to Asia, to Southeast Asia, that is, I'm sorry, 95 million people, that region in itself will be flooded and won't be able to produce that one uh, food source so critical to that region. Now, the association of food with social unrest is well understood. Um, it is well understood now that the Arab Spring started from essentially um, drought and fires in Russia and Kazakhstan and Ukraine, the largest exporters of, of, uh, of wheat and grain in the world. Do you know who the number one importer of wheat in the world is? Egypt. Egypt, which was one of the key uh, actors in the Arab Spring. The price of wheat went up 66%. A man set himself on fire in a food market in Tunisia, which set the, the, uh, the stage for the Arab Spring. Syria, of course, has a brutal dictator, but Syria also had six years of consecutive drought, which killed 60% of its cattle, 80% uh, of its cattle, I'm sorry, and 60% of its agricultural land. Food is a major destabilizer. People do not go to war if they have enough food and water on the table, okay? We see that El Nino years, which are hotter, are generally driving more conflict around the world. Somalia, Ethiopia, um, Afghanistan, South Sudan, the whole Sahel region of Africa is presently undergoing tremendous stress. Insects. Animals, plants are all moving away. And so evidently people also will move away. It is a natural phenomenon. These regions are becoming more and more unlivable. It is becoming impossible to work and harvest the land. You cannot work when it's 50 degrees outside. Humans are not designed to sustain those types of temperature. And it is the biggest driver of geopolitical instability. And it is this monster in the room. The UN has predicted that we will have 350 to 1 billion climate refugees within this century. Now, I don't have to tell you what 1.5 million people did to Europe and the concept of democracy throughout the world. Uh, we had an interesting talk with our ambassador earlier, but quite frankly, there are a few things that uh, some of us will have to take issue with. And one of them is this notion that somehow building walls is going to be a solution to anything. We know historically that that does not work because walls are built to be breached and that people who are desperate do desperate things, and one of them is conflict. So what are we doing? Uh, that's a good question. I think that the question that we need to ask all is that it took 4.5 billion years to create a system that was conducive for human life, and it took us about 100 years to screw it up. Now, the paleontological timescale gives us an understanding of how little time we've spent. And it's very important to understand where we've come from in order to realize where we're going. But today we have science and technology to help us understand and to help us solve solutions. And yet, we live in this false sense of security. We've created these urban environments where we found technological solutions to give us the illusion that we're safe putting all our little problems into an envelope that we call a bill and making the problem go away. Well, I'll tell you something about the polar regions, is that when you're out there, everything that you leave on the ground, you see it. 
Nature doesn't have to flex its muscle to make you feel insignificant. That is the reality of a natural cycle and a natural environment that we live in. We are not hosts on this planet. We are guests. And our technical engineering, our philosophical acumen, and our intelligence is meant to help us see through surviving on this planet. The planet itself will not see to it, and we are not safe. So science is under attack uh, today, more so perhaps than the days of Copernicus. It is unsettling to see how much special interest, partisan politics, and plain ignorance is driving policy. People have opinions about science in the way that they do about politics. It would be like having an opinion on gravity. Will the glass I hold drop to the ground if I, leave, if I let it go? It's not a matter of an opinion. This is a scientific fact. So we are literally, we have been culturally allowing to let these attacks on science happen. And I think that this is very dangerous. It is a path that we've discussed earlier. It was an interesting discussion yesterday about the nature of people not wanting real news because it's depressing, um, because it's, uh, it's not the type of feel-good story that we'd like to have. And yet, there is an incontrovertible system of natural cycles that is taking place. So it's not all bad, of course. We, we have incredible resources, and we can't wallow in doom. In fact, this is a time of tremendous opportunity. If the first industrial revolution gave us the steam engine and the locomotive and transportation and optimizing carbon energy, this fourth wave of, of technological innovation, which brings us artificial intelligence, nanotech, biotech, has to factor in as its hallmark a market transformation towards a sustainable economy. It has to. Because otherwise, that statistic of 75% disappearing species by the end of the century, that will be one of us. We will be in that percentile. Whether it happens at the end of the century or at the end of the next, Stephen Hawking believed that we had no future on this planet within 1,000 years. That was 15 years ago. A logical recalculation and recalibration of Stephen Hawking's modeling would place the end of humanity within the next 300 years. I'm not kidding. This is the real deal. So while you're thinking about your investments, so many countries are taking the lead into divesting from the negative impact of certain technologies onto our society. That is our responsibility today. And many of you have that opportunity to support startups that are disruptive technologies but also to divest from traditional investments that are negative to this planet. Because the train has left the station. The question is whether or not we have time to actually run after it and jump on it, and then change the course of where it's going. So one of the more exciting things, we have transportation uh, already well on the way. Uh, the question is, can we speed up this transition towards a zero emission? And I think that we can. But what is really exciting these days, in my opinion anyway, is this 2.0 version of uh, energy production and distribution. Smart grid, intelligent generation of, uh, of electricity and power within each house that is distributed peer-to-peer. -peer. It is organized collaboratively and scaled laterally. That is, I think, the most exciting thing that is happening right now in energy production. It is, there's tons of room for investments in that field. And we've talked earlier about blockchain technology. I fundamentally believe that the decentralized distribution of that type of information, data um, generation on production and distribution of energy, uh, that the blockchain is going to be central to that discussion. All this can seem pretty daunting. This is a, an interesting, maybe some of you have seen it. Tony Seba came up with this slide. It's called the Where is the Car? And this is Fifth Avenue in 1900. If you're in the horse and buggy business, you're probably having a pretty good year. Um, the one circle here is the one car in 1900. This is 
Fifth Avenue in 1913, and it gives you an idea of how quickly trends can transform. Within 13 years, if you were in the horse and buggy business, I have a sense that you're probably not having a very good year in 1913. But if you were in the transportation technology with cars, you obviously would be thriving. Today, two-thirds of new power that has come online in 2018, two-thirds of new power that came online was from renewable energy. Okay? The scalability and the cost drop of solar panel has been tremendous. 10% drop in costs every year for the last 30 years. In 2002, experts would tell us that it would take about, by 2010, we would bring one gigawatt of solar power online by 2010. We've exceeded that 68 times over this year. So the cost of solar is dropping tremendously. There is a energy revolution on the way, and the market forces are going to be driving that, and that means investments, it means disruptive technology, and it means moving the ball forward. Do not stay anchored into the old technology. Not only is it bad for business in the long run, but more importantly, it's bad for your conscience, and that should matter. Okay, the paradigm of industrial development needs to now include a third element to the transformation of our societies. Science and technology is driving transformation on, uh, in, in, in our societies, but that is essentially something that algorithms can, can take care of. The one element that is missing, in my opinion, is what makes us fundamentally and inherently human, and that is empathy. Science, technology, and empathy is the celebration of the human potential. And that is, incidentally, the one thing that can pull us out of this hole. So, there's a cross by Scott Base on Antarctica that was placed there by the men of the Terra Nova expedition in memory of Captain Falcon Scott, who perished on his way back from the South Pole in 1912. These words were picked by Cherry Garrard uh, from a poem by Tennyson. To strive to seek, to find, and not to yield, to strive, to aspire, to seek, to find, I'm sorry, to, to seek, to, to, to search, to find, and not to give up. That poem by Tennyson talks about Ulysses, and it's his crew of old and tired sailors who would never give up. It's become a central tenet of my expeditions. Um, I've had 13 major expeditions in the polar regions, but it's not really about expeditions. This is really a celebration of the human spirit, and it should be a central tenet for our times. Thanks to these, we need to rethink our relationship to the natural system and herald in this new age of development. Churchill used to say that Americans, and I think this is something that can apply to humans in general, but that Americans always did the right thing, but that it generally took exhausting every other possibility before getting there. Well, we don't have that luxury. We have 30 years to get it done, and I hope that you'll be part of that movement. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>